After the Great War, the survivors of Appalachia formed the factions which would struggle to rebuild, defend, or pillage. The Enclave plotted to finish the war with China from its bunker below the White Spring, while the Free Staters looked forward to a future without government interference. The Responders, a group of police, firefighters, doctors, and citizen volunteers, banded together to help those in need and bring order from chaos. David Thorpe and his raider gangs became the scourge of the region, taking what they wanted from whomever they wanted, building a kingdom for themselves in the Savage Divide. And Taggarty's Thunder joined the Brotherhood of Steel to find and safeguard technology for the future. None of them were prepared for what came next. This special Fallout 76 Modus Files podcast miniseries will follow each of these factions in their final days and hours and reveal the stories of The Last Days of Appalachia. The responders were the best hope for the rebuilding of Appalachia. In 2082, the tragic Christmas flood destroyed Charleston, but the responders endured. In 2096, the scorched overran the Morgantown Airport, chasing the remnants to the banks of the Ohio River with whatever survivors they could find. In the end, they ran out of men, guns, and most importantly, time. Relive the final hours of the responders in the Fallout 76 podcast miniseries, The Last Days of Appalachia. Last stand at Point Pleasant. Provisional Captain Bob Thompson, commander of the responders, sat behind an old, worn desk in what passed for Responder HQ in Point Pleasant. Provisional only because there was no one left with a higher rank to officially promote him. He was keying the mic on a jury-rigged radio. Jessica, come in. What's your status? Damn it, Jessica. What the hell's going on down there? Over. Horses, Bob. We're still here. That last wave almost made it over the bridge. I got wounded and three dead, but we got the civilians across. They should be heading into town now. Over. Thank God. Good work, Jessica. How much longer can you hold? We're mighty low on ammo here, Bob. They just keep coming. I need more men, otherwise I don't think we can hold against another attack. <sighs> It's been the story of the responders for a few years now. Too little, too late. And now we've run out of men, out of guns, and out of time. I think I have a couple of guys here I can send to you. But that's it. Tom is holding the east line by his fingernails, too. I think we've waited for about as long as we can. Maybe for a few more hours. Give any other civilians one last chance to get to us. Over. Yeah. Okay, Bob. I'll take whatever you can send. No promises, but we'll stay as long as we can. Over and out. The radio went silent and Bob leaned back in his chair. Only Melody Larkin herself, may she rest in peace, could outdo old Jessica for sheer stubbornness and ability to hold the line. She was a hard-bitten old fighter and her men loved her like a grandmother. No one could have guessed that she'd been a home economics teacher before the war. She joined the fire breathers after the flood 82. She lost her husband, her kids, and most of her class in the ruins of Charleston. After that, she dedicated her life to fighting. It was all she had left. She and Tom had been his best friends and field commanders. Jessica had been holding the southern line while Tom held the east. He'd been a mining executive before the war, but folks learned not to hold that against him. He turned out to be one of the good guys. He was also a natural tactician. Tom had insisted on wearing his old worn suit and tie, topped with a combat helmet, but despite the comical appearance, he led from the front, 
and hauled off more scorched attacks than they cared to count. It had been all downhill for them since the airport. Losing Charleston back in 82 had been bad, but at least they'd been able to regroup. Between Maria, Madigan, and the others, the responders had finally gotten their act together. Then the scorch came like a tidal wave across the region. Bob took off his old post office cap and scratched his head. He'd lost all of his hair over the years, but he'd lost his beer belly too, at least. Not that anyone had seen a beer since the disaster at Morgantown. He cracked his knuckles and pulled out a map. It was the old one that used to hang in the wall of the command center back at the airport. Maria Chavez herself had marked all the former responder positions on it. It had fallen to others and now Bob to cross off one outpost after the other as they lost contact with him or they were overrun. He remembered the masses of scorched boiling up from the south, overrunning their positions and swarming the barricades. It seemed like for every one they killed, two more took its place. Then the giant flying bats, the scorched beasts appeared. That had finally broken them. Those that didn't drop and run were killed. Or worse. There had been a few remaining fire breathers, the ones who hadn't died with Larkin trying to seal Big Ben, who kept open the line of retreat for those who could still get away. Bob had wanted to stay, but Maria grabbed him and pressed a pistol into his hands, and the map, and told him to get her people away. That had been the last he'd seen of her. Since then, he and the others who survived had made their way to Point Pleasant. The Scorch hadn't followed him right after the airport fell. They seemed too busy wiping out the few left behind. That little bit of breathing room had given them time to collect as many weapons as people as they could find. They'd even rigged a short-range transmitter up in the hills, letting any survivors know they were regrouping at Point Pleasant and that they'd get people across the Ohio River. It was the least they could do, to try to get as many people out of Appalachia as they could. Of course, that also meant making sure the Scorch Plague didn't escape either. While they couldn't cure the disease, and the vaccine research project ended with the fall of the airport, they could identify the carriers and the infected. Unfortunately, they had only one way of dealing with those who'd been infected. For Bob, it was the worst assignment he'd ever given. At first, a few of the others had taken care of it. But after Marshall committed suicide, he left a note saying he couldn't do it anymore and for God to forgive him. Bob took on the responsibility himself. It had been really bad for a couple of weeks. The one that almost broke him was an old couple who walked all the way from Sutton. By the time they arrived, both were infected, but they were still lucid. The others sent for him, and when he got there, the older gentleman had realized what was going to happen. At least he accepted it. His wife was fading fast and barely holding it together right at the end. Bob had taken him around back of the pharmacy. He tried to make it quick, and he still remembered the look in the man's eyes as he cradled his wife at the end. Now, Bob hardly slept at night. The nightmares were far too real. Bob got up from his desk and went out to the other room. His last remaining lieutenants were on their own handheld radios, keeping in contact with the other positions while eating a few of the last cans of cram. Over in the corner, sorting through their last boxes of ammunition, was just the person he was looking for. Zeke, come here. Ezekiel, though everyone just called him Zeke, had joined up with the responders a few weeks before the end at Morgantown. He was a young kid, maybe 19, but he was a natural leader and had got a lot of people out of the airport that day. Now he was Bob's unofficial second-in-command. He jogged over. His salvaged old army fatigues flopped as he moved as they were made for someone much bigger than he was. What, Chief? Jessica's barely holding on. Is there anyone we can send? I guess I can grab Nick and Stacy. I wouldn't call them rested, but... Yeah, get them moving. Any ammo we can spare, send them with them too. Chief, we don't have that much left. I just sent the last of our 308 over to Tom. We have some 38 and some 45 and a few leftover Molotovs, but that's it. Pretty soon we might just be throwing rocks. I know. We're just about done here. Pretty much anyone who can get to us has already done so. Maybe another day, at most. Then we all head over to the bridge. Zeke gave what passed for a salute and went downstairs to give Nick and Stacy the news. The other responders looked over to Bob. Each and every one of them had been through the same hell, and they had the scars to prove it. They were all wearing their responder garb, paramedic jumpsuits, or old firefighter uniforms, now torn and dirty, but worn proudly. It wasn't going to be long now, and most of them harbored no more than the faintest of hope that they'd live to see tomorrow. I need some air.
How does the song Country Roads begin? Almost heaven, West Virginia, right? A lot has changed in Appalachia since the Scorch Plague, and it is far from heaven now. Far from Heaven, a Fallout 76 story, is a rich and immersive audio drama based upon the popular video game. With strong storytelling and fascinating characters from across many familiar factions, Far From Heaven is a podcast fans of the video game will love. Available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, Amazon and many other great podcasting platforms. Far From Heaven, a Fallout 76 story, available now. Bob went downstairs himself and out onto the street. Makeshift tents and shelters dominated the town. The buildings were mostly ruined and offered little in the way of cover from the elements. The sounds of gunfire could be heard coming from the outskirts, so regular now to most folks that it was normal as hearing the crickets at night. He walked along the waterfront, watching his few remaining responders caring for the wounded or directing civilians across the bridge to the other side of the Ohio. Looking across the river, he could see the shanty town that had grown there, though it was just a stopping point as most people kept walking. None of them wanted to be anywhere near Appalachia. Only a handful of his men had gone across the river, mostly to ensure the folks had whatever supplies they could scrounge up before heading west. They dedicated their lives to helping people, and right now that meant making a stand at Point Pleasant and getting civilians to safety. In the end, they'd blow the bridge and keep the scorch contained. A breeze was blowing from the west, and it carried the smoke away from town, but it couldn't mask the increased sounds of gunfire or the explosions. It was a single banjo playing somewhere along the rooftops. It reminded him of better times, but it also sounded a bit like a funeral dirge, a last song for the dying. He walked over to their small field hospital set up right on the old boardwalk along the river. It was nothing more than a row of tents, tables, and a few beds. With their lack of even the most basic supplies, the best their few doctors could do was to patch up what they could, or comfort those who were dying. Joe, where are you? He saw a head pop out of an old tent a couple of rows down and look in his direction. Joel left the tent and walked over to a small water basin, washing the blood off his hands. Bob walked over to whom he considered to be his best and last field medic. Joel, it's about time. How many wounded do we have? Chief, this... There's just too many. And it isn't even just the wounded. Many of them have... They have all kinds of diseases... Some I had never even seen before. The best that we can do now is just to comfort them. I have honestly have no idea what we're supposed to do once we get them across. Or what we're going to be doing after. This has just been one hell of a mess. Look, I know we can't hold much longer. The best we can do is give those who are left a chance. And right now the only chance they have is to get across the river. Nothing over there can be half as bad as over here. (sighs) Okay, Chief. What do you want us to do? Start with the walking wounded. I want you, and I mean you personally, to get them moving across the bridge now. And who can't walk, and you can't carry, well, I don't think there's much we can do. Bob could see Joel's face start to get red. What he was asking went against everything the responders stood for. And just the thought of abandoning folks to die, or worse, it stuck in his craw. Wait, but Bob, you can't... Enough, Joel. You don't think I know what this means? Maria put me in charge. I didn't ask for this. But if we try to save everyone, we're not going to save anyone. Do you understand? Joel wanted to say something. Anything. But in the end, he could only nod. Look, don't go stupid on me. We don't need heroes. We need survivors. As soon as your boots hit the other side, you stay there. Get people moving west, as far from here as possible. Bob held out his hand. Joe looked down, hesitated briefly, and then took it. It's been good knowing you, Joe. Bob knew, if nothing else, that Joe would try his damnedest to get as many people across as possible, and that he'd follow orders. 
As Joel turned to start getting the wounded organized, Bob walked back along the riverside, passing the old Mothman statue. He hated it. The creepy visage always seemed to follow him, mocking him. He wished he could have had it torn down, but he had much bigger and real problems to deal with. Bob had one more person he needed to see. He walked up to the bridge and caught the attention of Engineer Tennyson. Just a kid, he'd learned everything there was to know about explosives from Sanjay Kumar himself. He also dragged a crate of high explosives all the way from Morgantown, on the off chance they needed to use them. Hey, Tennyson. Everything prepped? Tennyson was rechecking some wires and looked up, more than a bit annoyed. Been ready for the last two days. Keep checking things, but it won't change the fact that this will require manual detonation. Been over and over this, yeah, I know. It'll get handled. I just need a guarantee that nothing gets across this bridge. Nothing is certain, Chief. However, if everything goes boom, there's no way, no how, that anyone or anything is getting across that river. Tennyson turned around and went back to his wiring. Bob just shrugged his shoulders. He'd learned to trust his people. So if Tennyson was okay, he was okay. And that last part, about the manual detonation? Yeah, he already had planned for that, too. He spent the next couple hours of daylight walking the perimeter. His men all complained about the lack of weapons and ammo. They'd started arming themselves with nailed boards, golf clubs, and even a few rolling pins. Hand-to-hand with the Scorch was always a dicey proposition, but they were left with little choice. Bob was just about ready to head back when Zeke came running after him. Chief, we got a problem. We got nothing but problems, Zeke. Nah, Chief, this is bad. Got a group of civvies on the way. Maybe a hundred or so, just to the east of us. Lots of wounded, too. And scorched on their tail. A lot of them. Shit, shit, shit. Does Tom know? Yeah, he got the first call. He's thin. Real thin. I don't think he can hold for more than an hour. Probably less. He's begging for us to send anyone to help. Oh, hell. Zeke already knows if we had anyone or anything to send, we would have already. How long do we have? The group should reach Tom in maybe 45 minutes. Okay. Was hoping we'd have another day or two, but this ain't gonna happen. Get the word out. Everyone over the bridge. Get the civilians across now. Besides those helping, we all get our weapons and get ready. Bob started jogging back towards the command post with Zeke close behind. They passed along word to the other responders, who swung into action. They started getting people on their feet and moving in the direction of the bridge. Bob and Zeke took the stairs three at a time until they got into command. Dame, this is it. Come here. Bob motioned them all over and pulled out the old map, unrolling it out on the table. We've got... One last group of civilians coming from the east, and a shit ton of scorch behind them. We can't hold them for long, but we have to try. We'll pull Jessica back to support Tom, and we slowly collapse the line back into town. If we could keep the scorch focused on us, it should give the civilians time to get across the bridge. The group looked at the map and at each other. This is what they'd been waiting for, and feared for so long. There was nowhere else to run. As soon as the last of them are across, I'll give the signal for everyone else to get the hell out of Dodge. I can't promise you'll have a lot of time, because we can't let a single one of those things get out of Appalachia. But you'll have the time I can give you. The feeling in the room was grim, but they were all determined. When Bob told Jessica the plan, he had to hold the mic away from his ear to avoid losing his hearing to the string of curses which came across. The Scorts were testing her positions, and leaving anyone behind as a rear guard would be suicide. But in the end, she accepted her orders like the good fire breather she was. Bob grabbed his combat rifle. He had only a few magazines left, and he handed one to Zeke to make sure he had something to shoot. They all knew to make every shot count. Bob also picked up his machete. He carved the heads off of more than a few scorched, and he'd probably do a lot more of that today. Huh? 
Hi, I'm Fire Rider, and I'm the host of The Pixel People, a podcast dedicated to taking a close look at our favorite characters from our favorite video games. From major characters who define the course of a game's storyline, to smaller characters who you might have never noticed. Every week, we go beyond the quest line to examine a particular character's story arc and choices, and discover the real-world parallels and life lessons hidden just below the surface. I hope you'll join us. You can find the Pixel People on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and everywhere else you listen to podcasts. Right on time, they got word that the civilians arrived. It was worse than they could have imagined. It was mostly women and children, many of them suffering from dysentery, parasites, and hunger. They'd been running for hours after bumping into a group of scorched along the road. It had drawn in more and more of them. They had already lost more than half their people, including most of the men who stayed behind to buy time for their wives, sisters, and children to escape. Just as they cleared the forward positions and started the descent into town, the wave of scorched came down the road after, screaming and hissing. Tom and his men blanched when they saw how many there were. Hundreds, maybe even a few thousand, all running right at them. From their foxholes and barricades, the responders fired. They threw their last grenades and swung their rifles like clubs when all they had left were empty magazines. Jessica and her few men arrived, firing from the hip just as the scorch were about ready to overrun the line. Their added firepower was enough to beat back the horde and give them some breathing room. Bob followed the battle on the radio. It was bad, real bad. Tom had lost a lot of men, and many of the remaining were out of ammo. Jessica was barely holding things together, and to make the situation even worse, another force of Scorch was coming up from the south, ready to roll over the few responders Jessica left behind. Knowing it was time, Bob toggled the radio. Tom, Jessica, get your asses back into town. We'll try to use the rooftops as our cover. I'll show you where to go when you get here. Zeke had run forward and reached the incoming civilians. He and a few others got the women and children up to the bridge and started ferrying them across. Those too sick to move, they picked up and carried. It was as orderly as it could be, but as the sounds of gunfire and explosions came closer, reaching a crescendo, it began to turn into a stampede. He heard a few screams and splashes behind him. Zeke had to ignore the cries for help. There were too many kids in front of him and there was nothing he could do for anyone who went over the side. It was just a few minutes before Tom and Jessica arrived with their remaining men. Jesus, Tom. That shoulder looks pretty bad. You want someone to look at it? The old Irish mine executive just smiled and winced as he tried to shrug his shoulders. <laughs> Doesn't really matter much now, does it, Bob? We don't have the time, and the scorched are right behind us. Just tell me where you want us to go, and we'll hold out as long as we can. All right. I need you to cover the bridge. Take the rooftops of those three buildings. Tom wiped his brow and straightened his tie before giving a final salute and grabbing his men. And us? Jessica, are you sure you don't want to get across? Give me a break, Bob. I had to ask. Get to the church. It should give you a view of most of the town and draw their attention. You heard the chief, boys. Get moving and give them hell. Bob watched his friends jog to their positions. Already he could hear the sounds of the scorch getting closer. He was under no illusions that they'd be able to hold for long but every minute was a chance to get a few more people over the river. Bob heard someone shouting his name and saw Zeke bounding down from the bridge, holding his radio. Chief, we just lost the South Road Bridge. Hundreds of Scorch are coming right up the riverfront. No, crap. The sounds of gunfire and explosions increased. Everything was coming apart at the seams, and the only men he had left were a handful of walking wounded. Bob told Zeke to keep getting the rest of the civilians across while he ran to the nearly empty medical tents. When he arrived, the few men and women covered in bandages were already slinging rifles and grabbing pistols. Yeah, Chief. We already heard over the radio. Don't worry. We knew we weren't getting across anyway. This is our home. And we'll be damned if we just let these monsters have it without a fight. Even if it is the last one. Bob looked at the small group and could only nod. 
Without a word, they turned south and disappeared into the maelstrom. The town of Point Pleasant looked to be ringed in fire as the scorch pressed inward towards the river. From his position near the bridge, Bob could only watch through binoculars as a few responders and fire breathers attempted to hold back the hordes. He could see Jessica firing down from the church steeple, her gray hair highlighted against the smoke and flames. There looked to be countless scorch pouring down the streets, hissing and firing as they came. Bob and Zeke ran to the bridge as their final group of civilians were making their way across. Joel was leading a small group of children, all of them crying, but he did their best to keep moving. There was a scream on the radio. Bob picked it up and held it to his ear. Jessica! Jesus, Bob. They're everywhere. Being overrun. Goodbye, Jessica. Bob dropped the mic and wiped a tear from his eye. But there wasn't time to grieve. Tennyson ran up to the two responders. Guys, civilians are across. We gotta go. Bob looked across the town and saw flashes of rifle fire and scorched everywhere. He nodded and keyed his radio one last time. This is Responder Actual. Time to go. You've got five minutes to get across. Good luck and Godspeed. Bob chambered his combat rifle and sighted down to a group of scorched that had broken through their remaining men. Between him and Zeke, they killed more than a dozen, but more boiled from the buildings towards them. Tennyson dove to the ground as the scorch fired at them from the rooftops. The creatures weren't very accurate, but they made up for it with the volume of fire, forcing Bob and Zeke to take cover behind the bridge struts. Bob scanned the town for any sign that his men were getting away. Instead, he saw position after position overrun, and his men cut to pieces. He finally caught sight of Tom. He and three men were covering a small group of civilians trying to make a run for the bridge. They never made it. Overwhelmed by the scorch before they made it half a block. Tom dove from one barricade to another, firing as he went. He was with three men, then two, then it was just him. He made one last leap, but caught a sledgehammer to the chest and was laid out onto the road, his combat helmet bouncing down the street. Bob had to turn away as Tom was ripped apart by the host of Scorched. He knew it was over. Zeke, get the hell across. I'll cover you. No way, Chief. I'm staying with you. Bob knew the kid was stubborn. But this was only going to end one way. Okay, fine. But come here. I want to give you something. Zeke, of course, snuck over quickly, dodging the incoming fire. What, Chief? He never saw the sucker punch. Bob laid him out on the road, unconscious. What the hell? You two are getting across. Take Zeke and take this. Bob pulled out the old responder map from his back pocket and handed it to Tennyson. Give this to Zeke. Tell him I'm sorry. And tell Joel, get everyone west. Do not look back. Consider that my final order. Bob turned and started firing the rest of his magazine to another group of scorched. The explosives. Who's going to... Bob looked over his shoulder and just winked at him. I got this, kid. Now pick up Zeke and get the hell out of here. Tennyson was going to object. But as the volume of fire increased and they could hear the hissing and screaming from the scorched, he grabbed Zeke and was dragging him across the bridge. The detonator was on the strut just to Bob's right. All he had to do was flip the arming switch and push the plunger. Easy, really. But there was no coming back from it either. Bob fired off his last two magazines into the scorched trying to charge the bridge. He felt a slam and a sting as a bullet passed through his shoulder. Wincing, he tried to ignore the pain. He reached into his ammo pouch, but it was empty. Dropping his rifle, he pulled out his pistol the same pistol Maria Chavez had passed to him in Morgantown. Come and get it, you monsters! Bob was wielding his pistol and pulled out his machete. He stood tall in the middle of the bridge, facing more than a dozen scorched. Tennyson finally made it to the other side of the river, putting Zeke down on the ground. Joel ran over to check on the two of them. Both he and Tennyson looked across and saw Bob standing in the middle of the bridge, firing his pistol and swinging his machete like a sword, fighting off scorched after scorched. Bob still stood his ground, his old responder uniform now torn and bloodied. He yelled back at the scorched, daring them to attack. What seemed like hundreds of them charged forward, and Bob smiled. As they closed in, he stepped to the side and flipped the arming switch. And as he closed in for the kill, he hit the plunger.
Tennyson and Joel were blown off their feet by the explosion. The engineer had done his work well. The bridge shook with multiple blasts, with the entire center span collapsing into the river. Zeke slowly regained consciousness and realized Bob was gone. Both he and Tennyson watched the Scorch scream and hiss at them from the ruins of Point Pleasant. But eventually they lost interest and started wandering aimlessly through the town again. Joel limped over and helped the two of them to their feet. They all took one last look across the river before turning their backs and heading west into the unknown. Appalachia now belonged to the monsters. Thank you for joining us on our fourth episode of The Last Days of Appalachia. If you've enjoyed this content, please subscribe. And better yet, please leave a review to help others find us. You can follow us on Twitter, at Modus Files, for more information about this miniseries, and our main podcast, The Modus Files. I'd like to thank our cast, Hammered as Bob Thompson, Austin Rogers as Zeke, Letitia Lemon as Jessica, Penal Pineapple as Tom, Aaron Foster as Tennyson, XO One King as Joel, and introducing Rhea Cheshire as the Wounded Responder. We'd also like to thank Harry Skingle for providing the cover art for this miniseries, and a shout out to the Apocalyptic Aristocracy Discord, home to a great group of fellow creators, the Robots Radio Podcast community, and the rest of the Robots Radio Rocket Club, and Jeremiah Johnson, our favorite character artist who provided the wonderful character artwork you can find on our website. Lastly, thank you to all of our subscribers and supporters. We look forward to seeing you all again for our final episode in this series, Abby's Lament. <laughs>